When I started Your Guitar Mechanic as a uh, repair business, one of the things that I really looked forward to was uh, sitting and, and communing with uh, players of all levels uh, and, and, and hearing their experiences with the instrument and their journey in music. So when Paul Dozier brought in his Stratocaster for some upgrades, uh, he and I started chatting and come to find out uh, Paul's musical history uh, is long and deep and rich in stories from his times in Los Angeles growing up to his years that he lived in Detroit and now in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. The moment we started up uh, our conversation about his guitar and his journey, I knew that he had to be a guest on my show. Uh, so when he uh, picked up his guitar, his completed uh, upgraded Strad, uh, I asked him and he was more than obliging to uh, join me in a conversation. Uh, Paul Dozier, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, jazz guitarist. Enjoy. cool guitar in the back there is that that oh, one that you were telling me about that, no that, um, that well, nylon string yeah well that's one of my night no that's actually my yamaha nylon that's on the wall there nice and uh that one there is my custom um agile 335 version that i had made some years ago i have two of those but that's one of them on the wall and, and then that's made. my agile strat that i was telling uh, you about uh-huh nice yeah nice guitars man and uh so that's just a few of them i got the, all the rest of them in cases on the floor <laughs> uh, how's that how's your strat uh working out the one that you brought to I my shop look i just told my wife i haven't played my gnl about the last six or seven gigs <laughs> i've been playing the strat <laughs> really this the really the one that you brought to my shop yeah you so didn't like it job. that much man man Excellent. you did a great job man and uh it feels great and um uh, yeah so now i because i played that strat for years yeah i could tell when you that was my go-to guitar even before i got into the gnls and then um, then i found the gnls and i really like the gnls too but uh it was my mission to get that strat back on um you know back to working you know the way yeah. i wanted it, you know so definitely and, so, and the yeah. gnl the gnl i mean leo fender when he left fender uh went on to form gnl and they say he yeah took some tra he took some secrets with him oh yeah and George. it actually yeah. made him better yeah man listen you know like i said uh i have one that's kind of like an american made and then i have another one that's an indonesian and that one there i'll tell you need some filing down on the um frets the frets are just okay. too bulky like so like a spread dressing yeah i'll probably bring that to you soon Did you just say hey man, oh, i look keep forward it to it yeah, and I'll say keep it and let me know when you finish. <laughs> There's no rush, man. You know, it's just that, uh, you know, I play, it stays at my church. I play at church on Sunday morning, so it just stays there. I leave it on my guitar rack, and, you know, it's a beautiful guitar. It's a nice uh, bluish green color and a uh, nice finish on it, you know. And, and, and your Agile, that was on your first few albums, right? That used to be your go-to guitar. Well, it still is. See, the thing is, I only mm -hmm. play the strats when I do like, uh, you know, uh, you know, like, you know, like work for other people when I'm kind of like, uh, you know, like a hired musician. Okay. To, uh, some of these jazz guys. But when it's Paul Dozier, oh, no, it's my 335s. Okay. And, oh, and yeah. why is that? Is, is it because the strat feels more versatile? No, no, no. Well, the strat cuts, you know, cuts and strats kind of like, you know, for distortion and that sort of thing it just cuts better okay you know what i mean and uh the three uh the 335 is more uh it gives you a combination of the hollow body feel the hollow body sound the warmness yeah, yeah. Warm you know what I mean? yeah. yeah man yeah so you know uh you know for jazz i go with the semi hollow bodies 
Absolutely. And, and you can hear it in your, in your, in your style. I've been, are all of the tunes on Spotify, everything that you've recorded? I was wondering that every time I discover a musician on Spotify, I wonder if I'm looking at their whole catalog. Is that everything that you've done? Oh, no. I, I you know, I figured as much. You, you have I to have albums. Money. I got albums dated back to 99, 1999. And, but see what I was doing back then, I was doing something called Christian jazz. Okay. Okay. And uh, I was doing, I was taking a lot of inspirational songs and doing them instrumental. Oh, neat. And, uh, yeah, I had a whole lot of success in that, man, where I, I did a lot of traveling back in the 80s, you know, during the late 80s and 90s, okay. all overseas and stuff, you know, doing that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I, I really didn't break into uh, mainstream jazz until 2005. That was oh, wow. Mainstream jazz. And I, uh, I had a record deal out of Canada. Oh, wow. and uh, that album is not on Spotify. Huh. And how? And is it because of the publisher has the rights and you don't have the catalog? And and now, why haven't those been put on Spotify? Yeah, I would have to re-release that stuff on Spotify, and I just haven't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I plan on it. You know, I should, and I probably will. Dude, I, I look forward to. I look forward to hearing it. Yeah, yeah, was it all? All traditional Christian tunes, or did you? Have oh some no, 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 okay. uh, uh, no, no! I wrote a lot. Most of them I wrote. Oh okay. yeah, most of them are, are are original compositions. Yeah. Oh man, awesome! Dating all the way back to the first time you recorded your own track. What, what year was that? Um, when I went solo, ninety. I have to, and for, and, the, and I ask the listeners forgiveness because you and I. I've sat down for a while and talked about your background and where you're from and your origins. You know, well, how, how did you, when did you first pick up the guitar? Did, when, where okay. did it start? When did it start? All right. And actually, uh, Detroit was kind of like later, later on. I am originally oh, wow. from Los Angeles. Oh, so it was LA first and then Detroit. Yes. Yes. And you know what? When you told me that, I was like, why? <laughs> you always hear stories about people leaving Detroit. You don't hear stories about people moving to Detroit. I moved I moved to Detroit in 1996. Okay. And prior to that, I spent the first 36 years of my life in Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, I'm then, you know, but how I got started was I was uh, born into a musical family and um and, you know, my dad recognized uh, my brother and myself, you know, our gifts early. At, I was like five years old. Was your and, gift uh, guitar back then or no, another instrument? Well, well, I played around with guitar, but my dad groomed, well, he was groom, grooming me for the family quartet as a lead singer. Oh, man. Yeah. So I got my first training uh, in music was basically uh, to learn how to sing. So I was part of the quartet. I have to show you some of my pictures and 45s uh, that we recorded. Uh, we recorded uh, the first 45 when I was six years old. What, was that in the 70s? Oh, no, 60s. That was like oh. 66, yeah. Oh, cool. Southern Gospel. Oh, you know, cool. Yes, you know, like Southern Gospel, like the uh, Dixon Hummingbirds. I don't know if you heard it, you know, any these old gospel groups. Uh, Never have, but I'll look them up now. Yeah, you know, Mighty Clouds of Joy. Um, there's so many. And uh, so my dad came off the road from his professional gospel group and say, hey, my little, you know, my, you know, my boys are talented. So I'm going to go ahead and form a group with them. And that's how I got, you know, really got started. And so I didn't really get into the guitar. Well, like I said, I was always playing around on my own, but I wasn't good enough to be the guitar player or bass player for the quartet. Those were the duties of my older brothers. You know, I got good enough to where I start playing. I was kind of switching off with my brother playing bass. So uh, bass guitar was actually my first instrument. Bass. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then as far as guitar, I just learned as I went. And so so basically. uh, When it it came when it came, I'm sorry, Paul, when it came to bass and, and, and it was in a gospel environment. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of root notes and not a lot of thrills right. uh, keeping yeah, the bottom it, down. You know, uh, uh, traditional gospel is kind of like blues. Mm-hmm. Going from one to the five to the three, 
back okay. to the one. You know, okay. you know, if you think blues, you know, that's a whole lot of they say uh blues de really derives from gospel. And it's true. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And do so, you think that, that that structural playing of the bass gave you that foundation when it comes to guitar? Oh, to... most definitely. Yeah, oh yeah, oh definitely. And uh so and but you know, along with that and just learning how uh how to voice it because my dad taught us three part harmony because we had to sing three part harmony in the uh, wow. group so the thing is and we were self contained so you had to sing and play at the same time wow so yeah so i was a little guy you know you know doing that so uh it, what kind of bass did a little guy play man my dad <laughs> i remember my dad uh i don't listen man if you ever saw the uh jackson's story you know uh, the jackson yeah. five story yeah I mean, it, it was so similar my dad comes home one day from work here comes a bass guitar here comes wow. drums here comes guitars you know fender fender uh precision bass wow you know, wow uh, totally invested in it oh he, yeah he wants it to start let's get going let's do this oh that's story there's everything that you, we need yes it, it's kind of like and there's a scene in the jackson story if you saw it, it was the same way he came on with all these instruments and you know and uh so it was kind of like that and um and so that's when the dozier singers that was the name of the group that called the dozier singers got started and wow. uh we was a little you know like i said i was so small but at the same time i had the gift because my dad said oh boy these guys got pretty good perfect pitch you know and um so uh that's how it all got started with me you know and uh one thing just you know i just grew from there man i mean i knew at that age that i had something special then you know even yeah as well, yeah i, I said because yeah. it came so easy it came so i, I you know I didn't, my dad would say sing this note and i hit it right there and you know and we all you know was singing one three five chords you know, it's interesting, Paul, because I'm thinking about, you know, you always see these these dynamite kids on on social media. Oh, it's crazy. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, little kids playing drum licks that adults can't even manage, you oh, know, or, or guitar solos that are beyond. And it's just amazing. And, and, and do you think as a little kid picking up a bass and not only playing, but you're playing and singing, which as an yes. adult, I can't even do that. Right. That takes right. both hemispheres of your brain. Dude. It does. And it does. as a little kid, do you think it's because you don't have any one preconceived notions? You're not worried about being judged by other people. You're not going to be like, oh, God, am I going to mess it up? I'm going to hit a, a sour note or whatever. Or right. do, you think it, do you think it was also kind of maybe a little bit of pressure because your family was a, a unit, like everyone needed to keep up their, their corner of the house, if you will? Yeah. You know, the thing is, um, Pressure? No, it, it was just one of those things that I knew I was in a setting where, you know, my dad was teaching us and he was grooming us and uh, I was at peace, man. I was very comfortable. Okay. But, you know, I wasn't okay. concerned about hitting the wrong note or anything like that. Um, yeah. My dad just didn't tolerate laziness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was mm -hmm. serious about us learning the craft because he knew what was in us. So. You know, if we were coming to rehearsal lacking, you know, uh, he would, you know, he would get on us, man. <laughs> how did you, how did you rehearse bass? How did, how did you, did you listen and try and pick it up off the radio or records or? No, actually my dad, my dad and my older brother is what groomed me because my older brother was, he was like the first musician in the family as far as, uh, you know, well, you know, my dad played guitar, but my older brother, oh, he, okay. uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was playing, you know, when I was what, five, six years old, he was already playing. Wow. So, wow. you know, so he and I would get in the back room sometimes when we're not having a group rehearsal, we'll just be going through it, you know, he'll show me. Yeah. 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 Just kind of wish in the back room, you know, and, uh, and I picked up really, really, really fast. And, um, you know, so yeah, that's, you my know, brother you know, and I, my brother and I were the same way, man. It was, uh, he, he told me once, he ended up playing, he, we both played guitar, I, I started playing guitar, and mm -hmm. then he, he like, whoa, what's, what's Patrick doing? I'm going to go get a guitar, and he started, you know, picking it up, and then we'd have these jam sessions, 
but I always wanted to be the lead guitarist, right? Mm -hmm. So he'd hold yeah. down the rhythm. I'd play over top of him. And, and uh, decades later, uh, he ended up playing bass in a blues band, blues rock. And he told me, he said, the only reason I'm a really good bass player and I hold it down is because I did that with you all the time. You always had to play the solos. So I really <laughs> learned how to hit the pocket and, and stay with that. So Right, right. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, and yeah, and, 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 and you know, and that's true. You know, thing is, you, you find your place where you're supposed to be, you know, rhythm versus a lead. You know, I yeah. learned... I learned rhythm before I learned lead and uh, and the quartet, you know, it's really all about rhythm because you're just accompanying the uh, the singers, you know, what yeah. I mean? so you really Checking wasn't out there. the song and the lyrics. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. man, because, you know, we didn't have piano it was just bass and guitar. Mm -hmm. OK, so, you know, the, uh, hey, the guitar had to hold down the chords and, you know, the strums and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how it all took place you know in that mm -hmm. so, and one of your one of your brothers played drums the baby of the group he didn't join the group too much later okay but at the uh you know but we had drums there and sometimes i would get on the drums and play oh wow wow yeah you know so i you know i could play a little drums too you know because all the instruments were there and i just wanted to dabble in all of it <laughs> sure, sure. Well, you know what I mean? Candy store. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. So I was able to uh, uh, pick up on drums. My older brother, he he played some drums also. Uh, so yeah, like you said, man, like a kid in a candy store. I mean, you know, we just took advantage of, you know, everything that we had. And, uh, Absolutely. If your dad's gonna buy it, right? I mean, and bring it home. Oh yeah. Not? Hey, <laughs> you know what? He was serious, man, about making this group. And you know, and I knew we were serious, man. When we went to re to the recording studio, I'm like, "We're in a recording studio." How old uh, were you? I was six. Oh man! And not even the baby of the group was the baby of the group part of it yet. No, he no, okay. he didn't join. Uh, I think he joined uh, maybe when I became nine. You know, some years later. You know, six and, years uh, old, holding a bass guitar. Singing mm -hmm. vocals. Did you do it at the same time in the studio? Turn on the microphone, turn on the reel to reel and go? Or did yep, you overlay? We really? No. Nope. Yeah, it was no overdubs, man. Well, we had two tracks back then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bro. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, we just, hey, take one, take two, you know. Uh -huh, it, it, uh -huh. But, you know, yeah, you know, like, you know, like we went in very well rehearsed, you know, because we always rehearse. So, yeah. it was just, you know, my dad said, hey, just thank you in rehearsal. And let's just go ahead and make a tape and get the best tape. And sure. uh, so, yeah, man, um, six years old, recorded the first 45. And, and that's when I knew that, oh, boy. And then we start doing personal appearances, man. We would go all over wow. the city. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And, you know, my dad would take us to all the professional uh, concerts that would come in, groups would come in who was really, really, really big. And we, we went to all of those because my dad wanted us to observe and to see what the you know those guys are doing and you know we come back and you know okay so what do we learn from these professional guys wow. you know? yeah oh yeah man it was instilling a really good work ethic in you guys oh yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. you know, he, yeah yeah he was very serious about bringing it out of us uh -huh. you know yeah very, very serious so was he was he your uh was he the uh, band's promoter or did he hire a promotion company or no, did he walk no. around at the 45 and and sell you yeah. guys with it and no the, uh, the thing is he hey my dad he was the manager he was the daddy wow he was uh <laughs> he was the security man <laughs> nice. he was everything yeah, no, no, we didn't have because he didn't trust anybody. He kept us away from a lot of riff rap, which was great. Oh, okay, okay. Guitar Garage Talk is brought to you by YourGuitarMechanic.com. Setups, repairs, restrings, and more. Whatever your guitar or bass needs, we can get it done. Offering pickup and delivery service in the greater Charlotte, North Carolina area. YourGuitarMechanic.com. Now, back to the program. So your ear is gospel. You are six years old. You're really yep. steeped in it. You're yep. watching professional gospel acts and, and touring bands. When, mm -hmm. when did it start creeping in? Like, 
wow, okay, not only do I want to pick up the guitar, but you know, what am I hearing on the radio here that I maybe I might want to start playing this stuff? Okay, yeah. So, so the thing is, um, we were always looking at uh, American Bandstand, uh huh, those shows, and we would see the Motowns. And boy, when Motown, we start listening to some of the Motown groups and stuff, and we would say, yeah. man, you know, seeing the Temptations and you know, all those groups. And I, you know, so we started to kind of broaden our, 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 our senses as far as uh, other styles of music, you know. So, so when we wasn't like doing our gospel stuff, we'd be at home doing some Motown just <laughs> on our own, you know what I mean? And okay. uh, just kind of picking up on those tunes, like Heard It Through the Grapevine, you know, just, you okay, know, just, cool. Yeah, you know, and, you know, I was still a kid, you know, just doing that stuff. And, and your um, dad didn't discourage that. He he let it happen. Well, we kind of snuck around it. <laughs> oh, I got you. <laughs> you know okay. what I mean? You know, guys, you know, my dad would wake up every morning at 5 a.m., go to work, and he would get home to maybe like 4 or 5 that evening. So, you know, so we would and be... in the meantime, you taught yourself shotgun by the Eisen Brothers or something. There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go, man. You know, and then, you know, and then my brother, he, my brother was a trumpet player. He, that was his secondary uh, instrument, and so he was into jazz. We had all the okay. jazz albums from Miles to Lee Morgan. I mean, you name it, all the jazz albums from every sort of player you want to know. I mean, piano player George Duke. I mean, Herbie Hancock. I mean, you name nice. it. Nice. So when those albums were on, man, I fell in love with jazz at a very, very Why? Why? What was it about jazz that attracted you? Yeah, just the freedom of the music. And that was the first word that I thought of, the freedom. Yeah, the freedom and the improvisation and just yeah. the um, just the overall chord structures. And and I would sit there and it was almost like I was just absorbing. I'm like, man, that's a very nice sounding chord, although I don't really know what it is. <laughs> you know? Sure, but it, right, you right. Know, but I was just absorbing all that stuff because I can hear... See, the thing about me, and people will tell me today, you know, my ears is my best asset, you know what yeah. I mean? And what gets me, and I've heard Herbie Hancock say this too, you know, say, hey, you know, the best players don't even have to read, mm. but they have, if they have the best ear, those are the best musicians or the best singers or the ones that can hear, have great ears. So I knew that my ears were pretty darn good. Okay. Because uh, I could correct some of my brothers, you know, in the group sometimes if if they were singing the wrong note. <laughs> wow. You know, so I said, oh, boy. And so, yeah, so um, jazz was, so when we fell in love with jazz, and then that's when things start to really catapult with me. And then when I got into the seventh grade of junior high school, I wanted to take another, I wanted to, you know, take up a horn instrument. Oh, wow. so I like sax probably, huh? That's exactly what happened. Uh -huh. I, I I didn't, I said, man, saxophone has so many keys. Yeah. I said, okay. I said, all right. I wanted to play trombone. And then my brother said, don't play trombone. <laughs> he said, he said, listen, he said, you won't get any girls with the trombone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but here's the thing. What what we know now is if you're a really good trombonist, there's so few of them out there that you'd be yeah. getting gigs left and right. Oh yeah, I, yeah, you're right. You know, so I picked up the tenor sax, and so I did. You know, nice. so, I, so I start playing, and man, once I got it, I got it, and by the end of the summer, wow, I was playing. And then when oh, the fall God. came, when fall came, they moved me to advanced band. Wow. Who were you listening to on sax? Who was, oh, man. Who was moving you? Listen, man, like I said, we were listening to jazz all that time. Yeah. Back yeah. then, you know, uh, Cannibal Adderley. I mean, Charlie mm. Parker. Good I, choice. We were listening, I was listening to all those guys. 
I said, man, those guys are playing too fast for me. But I was yeah, listening because right. I was absorbing it. Sure. You know, and, and I knew one day I said, I could probably get to that level one day. You know uh-huh. what I mean? You know, but I was just I was just very intrigued by what I was hearing, you know. Sure, sure. And yeah, so I was in advanced band after say three, four months of first picking up the saxophone. Then he had formed a jazz band in the junior high school, and I was part of the jazz band. Were you and still with the family quartet playing bass as yep. well? Yep. Still doing family recordings, court. still hitting yep. the studio. Yep. Okay. Yep. And your dad that, knew that, uh oh, my son has discovered jazz. He might you, be breaking out on his own someday. Well, 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 see the thing, it, it was okay because my my older sister was in the bands, my brother oh, wow. was in the band, my other brothers was in the orchestras in school. He didn't care about what went on, you know, in schools. Oh, okay. He didn't care about all that stuff, you know what I mean? So, you know, the thing is, so when I got into the jazz band and stuff like that, you know, and, uh, Gosh, you know, he would come to the concerts and see us, you know. Awesome. You know? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, so from that, I actually spent a lot of time on saxophone from, say, 12 all the way through high school. Wow. And I got so good to the point, man, to where I had a lot of people pulling my coattails to come do sessions. And, you know, I, I had one situation where well i played my first professional gig i don't know if you heard of this guy you ever heard of the heath brothers heath percy heath oh i've heard of percy heath yeah bass player after the heath brothers yes oh wow okay okay now they had a brother by the name of tootie heath he was a drummer his name was albert tootie heath he just died so uh he's wrong too maybe 80 something years old but uh when I was in high school, my high school teacher knew him. He lived in the area in L.A. on the west side. And so he came to one of our rehearsals and he heard us. And, wow. so, you know, so he, he felt like I was somewhat of a standout. Nice. And he told my teacher, he said, you know, my teacher was already going to play a gig with him. So he asked, he asked my teacher, he said, you, you know, why don't you bring this kid? You think, and I wasn't really old enough to play in a club. I was only 17. Right. <laughs> but my teacher picked me up and I played my first gig with Tootie Heath. Dude, awesome. I mean, in, in LA, what, I mean, it's a hotbed of musical yeah. activity. What, what uh, was that, the early 70s by now? This was 77. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 77. I was, uh, uh, I was about to graduate from high school. And what did Tootie play? Just some standards? Drummer. Like, hey, do you, do you, yeah, man, we just played some standards, some blues, jazzy, you know, kind of jazzy blues stuff, you know, and I can't even remember the songs we did, but it was kind of something that we all knew that I could play, you know what I mean? And um, and it was one gig? You didn't follow well, up with any other? One gig? No. Well, the funny thing what is, he was, <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what happened. The thing is, he called me the next couple of days. I got a call, and it was Tootie himself called me, not my teacher, Tootie. I'm like, oh, how does guy get my number, you know? But I knew that my, do- uh, that my dad would have a problem with me um, going on tour with this guy. And I didn't really know this guy like that, you know? I'm like, mm. this guy wants me to go on. I-, I said, I don't really, I just did one gig with him. But this guy was saying, hey, man, you know, we like you, man. And you know, this and that, but I, you know, my dad had already schooled us about the industry and mm-hmm. the do's and the don'ts and the things to watch mm-hmm. out for, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of uh, darkness behind. <laughs> and you kind of sense that with Tootie and his act? Yeah. Cause there were some things he was saying, you know, like, oh, okay. Okay. I'm not, I and said, you're, you're well, still 17 years old or whatever. I mean, yeah, going 17. on the road, no way. No, nah, yeah, exactly. I'm gonna try to go on the roll with some guy, you know, in his 30s or 40s. I'm like, nah, you know, I had a lot of wisdom, man. Because I, hey, my dad put a lot of wisdom in us at a very early age. So, <laughs> it's yeah. Like, so yeah, so so th- those are my saxophone days, and and then um, I didn't to really be honest with you, I didn't really get serious with guitar until I always played guitar. But I didn't really okay. get serious with guitar until 
I would say around 17, 18. Oh, right after the 2D incident then. Yeah. You if know, you I, was, I was yeah, I was playing, I was kind of still playing in high school, doing some little uh -huh. things, but uh -huh. sa hey, saxophone was my go-to because everybody was calling me, hey man, you're the next Kenny G. Hey man, you're the next Grover Wajin. Hey man, you're the next this. You know what I mean? And so oh, I uh, love Grover, man. He's just uh, talk about diverse uh, catalog. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, man. You know, he was his my 70s man. Grover. My, one of my favorite recordings is uh, his, his 70s stuff. Oh God, yeah, man. You know, listen, man. When Mr. Magic came out, I'm like, oh, yeah, that one. I'm like, dude, uh, this is what I want to do. Absolutely. <laughs> it's this it's guy got super heavy funk. He doesn't yeah. have to play these bop lines. He he'll just play like this one line, kind of repeated, you know, and just be part of the act. And it's not even yeah. really. He wasn't the 80s Grover where he had to sing the tune and, you know, the saxophone maybe every so often. But that was, right. that was some good stuff right there. Oh, yeah, man. And so, you know, um, so I said, OK, this is kind of like it's not jazzy jazz, but it's just uh -huh. really smooth jazz. So I said, OK, it's kind of like the smooth jazz. Okay. I say it's kind of like the beginning of smooth jazz. You know, I said, OK. You, I said, OK. Is cool. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and so I found myself, uh, you know, doing guitar and sax at the same time. You know, who, who put the bug in your ear about guitar? Like, was it one day it's like, dude, I heard blah, blah, blah on this one well, recording. And I'm like, oh, well, you know what? I think I can take guitar there. Well, the thing is, I got really serious with guitar. What happened was, uh, let's go a little down the road. I... Um, my brother and I, we had some local bands that we were playing around in L.A. And uh, I would play some guitar and I would play sax. I was going back and forth. So I would play sax on some tunes and I play guitar on some tunes. So cool. So I was uh, advancing my growth, you know, in guitar then. So that's around 18. And then, you know, kept doing that, kept doing that. And uh, I played saxophone and guitar for the most part all the way up to uh i'll say man all the way up to the 90s wow. i was yeah i was a i was a switch you know i switched off so you were like a dual threat bands would call yeah. you up to either do one or the other or even both sometimes yeah yeah, okay. yeah 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 i would do guitar gigs i would do saxophone gigs and i would do some bass gigs okay sure right yeah 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 as so, uh you know i was doing it all so you know the thing is uh so I, I I created a band uh, going to the mid '80s. Now I was around 25, and uh, I created a contemporary Christian band, and uh, we got a major record deal. Well, who did you, major, who did, who did you like put an ad out there like need a bass player, need a drummer, need a? Uh -uh. Or well, actually, I'm gonna tell you. Okay, I'm gonna tell you what happened. There was two guys who are already together. I actually joined them, but they were like an acapella group. And what happened was I built a self-contained band around them. I knew a drummer, I knew a bass player, and I knew a keyboard player, and I would be the guitar player. So I brought those guys in, and we formed this group that was a contemporary, um, that's when contemporary gospel got, got real famous. You heard of the Winans? Yes. Yeah, so that's when that was like around in the eighties when that stuff started taking off. So that's when I created that, and uh, we uh, we did very well. We were always, in, you know, we were really big in Europe. Oh wow! And, uh, so you toured Europe? Oh yeah, a few times. Wow, very cool. Yeah, yeah, and so and we had a uh, major distribution deal with A and M Records. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, and uh, so. Uh, we were doing that. So what happened was from 85, I was still playing saxophone and guitar and I was doing some co-lead singing, you know, in the group, you know, we were a self-contained group. And so um, that went from 85 all the way to 1990. I did a, a tour. Last tour I did with them was around 1989. And there was just something in me that just say it's time to make a move time to go i just got tired of just being part you know i just needed something different i just knew something okay. on me to just kind of 
launch off into a whole different direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I so I came back and um, I told them that I was going to uh, leave the group. They wasn't pleased about it because I was the producer and writer for the group. I produced mm -hmm. and wrote the music for both albums. Ah. So, uh, so that's when in 1990, I officially put down the sax. You picked the right time to, to just focus on one instrument and start yep. going solo because that, yep. you, you know, I start hearing names like, uh, uh um norman brown and paul jackson yeah you know when i was listening to your catalog paul uh those two guys and and little touches of earl clue too yep you know and then they were starting to blow up around then yes so you picked just the right time and the wave if you will started and you were you were jumping on it yeah exactly and you know and i knew that's what that's what was happening and I just knew that now what I did was in 1990, I didn't necessarily launch into the mainstream of smooth jazz. What I okay. did was I did smooth jazz, instrumental Christian music. Okay. Okay. So those the melody other albums, line, the lyrics are translated to a melody line, that kind of a exactly. thing. Exactly. And uh, someone hears it and they could sing along probably. If Most definitely, because there was a couple of guys already out there doing it. Guy by the name oh, yeah? of Ben Tinker. Yeah, this guy's a okay. pianist. Uh, there was another guy. Um, uh, you heard of Tim Bowman? No. Okay, yeah, he's out of Detroit, but uh, he, you know, he started out. He was a guitar player. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Christian smooth jazz was another genre, and Absolutely. so I, so I found myself into that, and I did that from nineteen. Dude, I did that for almost, yeah, all the way up to 2005. Were you still in L.A. at that time, or when, when was the move to Detroit? Uh, I moved to Detroit, was 96. Okay, so, so you went to Detroit, and then you started this new christian-inspired gospel-inspired well no no jazz. actually no actually that started when i was in la in 1990 i had 90 okay okay sorry and, you know, so yeah i started in 1990 then um i i continued on after i left la moved to detroit and um i, I was still doing it then and i like i said i did it all the way up to 2005 someone heard me um these canada pro uh, producers wanted to do an album on me on their new label out of Canada. And I said, hey, nice. and they wanted to do more of a mainstream. So they asked me where I put together some, uh, you know, write some songs. They had a couple of songs that they, they they wrote, you know, like for the album also. And so, yeah, so that album there uh, did pretty good for me. That was my first mainstream smooth jazz album. So you and, had some uh, tunes and they wrote some tunes for the album for you. Yeah, they had like a couple of tunes, yeah, but I, I wrote the majority of the songs for the album because I'm a writer. I'm a writer and uh, a composer before I am a musician. I always wrote music. Okay. I was I can even tell. writing music. I was even writing music for the high school jazz band. Nice. Yeah, so I you, was doing it. You, you know how to draft a chart. Oh, yeah, score. Uh -huh. yeah. Man, yeah. that's that's turning to a lost art, isn't it? Yeah. What do you, I mean, well, what do you think? What's your opinion on that? What's that, uh, scoring? You being able to, yeah, scoring and, and, and being able to, when you get these session musicians that come into a session, mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes, you know, they don't know how to read it or they, mm -hmm. you know, or well, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Is well, that you know, well, you know, you know, the thing is, um, when I was in LA, you know, Reading was kind of like a prerequisite, you know, you really, <laughs> you know, if you were going to get some gigs, man, especially some union gigs, mm. you had to know how to read. So, you sure. know, and so the thing is, I came up in during a time where, you know, reading was a necessity, you know, and uh, I, I didn't really know too many people who didn't know how to read. Awesome. You know, you know, you know, you know, you're speaking of Paul Jackson Jr. I used to hang out with Paul Jackson Jr. sometimes and oh, I've been over his house. Cool. And, yeah, you know, I've been over his house. He invited me over his house. He saw me at a gig playing one time. And he said, hey, man, give me your number, man. Hey, man, what you doing tomorrow, man? Come on over. Excellent. 
you know, so I hung out with him, you know, he and I talked for a while, but we lost contact over the years. But, um, but you know, he just shared with me, he said, Hey man, he said, it's good. You know how to read. He said, cause you know, he said, I'm over, he said, I'm on over hundreds and hundreds of albums because I'm a session player. And then I said, yeah, you know, I said, I get it. I said, I, I really would love to do what you do, <laughs> you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, so as far as me scoring, you know, like I said, I didn't know too many people who didn't know how to read. So um, when I was in high school, I learned how to score and I learned how to write for all the instruments, the trumpets, the trombones and piano. You know, I did all scored out, and, you know, turning the sheet music and we played the songs. And nice. uh, yeah, so I was writing music most of my life. You know what I mean? Even as a kid, I would write little songs, you know, so sure. nowadays, man. Nobody reads. <laughs> I see. That's what I was trying to get at is uh, the modern musician, if you yeah. will. And I don't want to I don't want to detract from it at all. But you're right. Yeah. Nobody reads. It's all by ear, by feel, uh, by, you know, history. I'm telling you, man, I get hired on some of these smooth jazz gigs. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm the only guy who's coming with sheet music. Really? I am. These guys, man, the drummer never has music. Yeah, right. they may have some chord changes on a pad, you know, the uh-huh, bass player, uh-huh. but nobody's really, nobody's reading music. So, you know, out of there and being jealous, you know, they pick at me. Oh, oh you, need to, <laughs> you know, oh, here, here, here comes Paul with that sheet music. <laughs> and then I would, and you know, and the guys who were playing, that we're playing for, they're very impressed. He said, wow, it's great to see guys still reading sheet music. Yeah. And then I look at yeah. them and smile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you're, yeah. and you're the only one with a chart up on the stage well you know what man 99.9 of the times when i'm on these gigs i'm the oldest guy wow and okay you know. so i should i should back up a little bit paul uh when you came in and brought your strat to me uh and i'm not even sure how it, how it came up but you said yeah i back up a lot you know a lot of acts that come through town I- uh middle c jazz the middle c thank you sir Mm-hmm. And uh, when you know you're a you're a dual threat because you like you like backing up, and you also do your own solo act. Yeah, I do my own solo acts. Not a whole lot of my own solo acts because um, <laughs> one thing I hate about leaving Detroit was I left my band. <laughs> oh man! And why did you leave Detroit? Uh, well, just when, how did you? When did you? I'm sorry. When did you leave LA for Detroit? And then I left, you leave Detroit? Okay, I left uh, LA for Detroit 1996, stayed there to 2014. Left that was your first uh, that's your first album on Spotify 2014. Yes. Yep. Your first yep. solo. First album. first solo on Spotify. Yeah, not my first solo album but on Spotify. Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. even know when Spotify even came out. Maybe, you know, I don't around even that know that streaming stuff. Yeah, probably around that time, but uh Okay. And so, um, so when I came to uh, Charlotte, you know, I know everything has changed. I said, man, a lot of these musicians are kind of like younger than my kids, you know what I'm saying? Like, but you know, and so, so for the most part, I'm playing with a lot of guys, you know, you know, thirties and a few forties, you know, these guys don't read music, you know, they don't do it the traditional way. Let me say that. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the guys that we play for, you know, they, they come, you know, they send the PDFs. So, hey, I just make copies of the PDFs and, you know, and just bring the sheet music and read it. You know what I mean? But these guys, they're on stage with their little uh, 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 iPads or whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. Listen to music. Okay, mm-hmm. how'd that go? Mm-hmm. I'm on gigs, man, and the drummer like, hey, man, how'd that go? I said, dude, we're in the middle of a gig. Are you asking me? How <laughs> how? There's people out there who pay their hard, you know, hard-earned yeah. money and... You're asking me how, how a song goes? <laughs> hey, man, what's that chord at a measure 35? Uh-huh. Don't you? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's difficult. So when I say my own gigs, yeah, I wouldn't use none of the guys I played with that I played with that I, you know, I'm part of the backup group. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't use none of these guys around me because I have a whole nother mindset mm. you know what i mean and uh so mm. so uh so i'll do my you know i have some guys that you know 
few gigs that I do do around here, I have some guys that uh, I depend on and they know how I operate. And, Absolutely. And, you got that unspoken communication on stage kind of, you know where you're definitely. all going. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I'm a whole different monster, man, when it's my stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely, right? You know what I mean? It's just kind of like, okay, yeah, this is Paul the nice guy over here, but but this expression on my face is Paul, the serious guy. <laughs> and I'll bet you a trillion dollars that came from your dad and the discipline that he instilled. Oh, in your dad. yeah. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. That's oh, your dad yeah. coming through. Oh, yeah. Hey, people tell me I'm definitely a reflection of my father. So, you know. And so you have your brothers. Have I'm sorry? I Go say, and you have to have that. You have to have that yeah. discipline. Absolutely. If you're going to do it right, do it yes, justice. Sir. Guitar Garage Talk is brought to you by YourGuitarMechanic.com. Setups, repairs, restrings, and more. Whatever your guitar or bass needs, we can get it done. Offering pickup and delivery service in the greater Charlotte, North Carolina area. YourGuitarMechanic.com. Now, back to the program. Yes, so sir. your brothers, they, did they shoot off and do their own thing too? Oh, man, yeah. My older brother, when he was 18, went off and played with the Temptations in 1971. Nice. He was a guitar player, toured with them when Dennis Edwards had taken over. He was when Dennis Edwards came on the scene from David Ruffin. Uh, so he he went on the road in like 71. Cool. Uh, do it playing, playing what? Guitar. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that the a, brother he, that you woodshedded with and tried to pick up stuff with? Yes. Yes. Okay. Most definitely. Yeah. I was a, I was very inspired by him. He was my inspiration, man. Because he was cool. doing it. He was doing it, man, at 10 years old. I mean doing it. Have you and ever so, thought about doing some duets with him? And oh man. Doing? Well, yeah, we have over the years. As a matter of fact, uh he's going to be here. We uh, a couple of years ago he came here because uh he toured with the Temptations. He toured with uh, Tom Jones. He toured nice. with uh, uh, Johnny Guitar Watson. Um, so what we did a couple of years ago, we did a Johnny Guitar Watson tribute. And I yes, I remember you told me about that. That's cool. yeah, man. And it was so cool, man. You know, and uh, we did Middle C, and we did a couple more clubs, you know, uh, around in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, so. Uh, yeah, so we have done some things together. So he's coming back here. We got a couple of dates. We got a date in Atlanta in August that we're doing a uh, first time I'm being there. Uh, uh, major club in Atlanta. You've oh, got same. a date on Spotify at Chase Lounge you know, on August 23rd in West yep. Columbia. Yep. Is your brother going to be at that gig? Yes. Really? What, and are yep. you going to do some Johnny? You're going to do some of that? The tribute no, stuff? No, I'm, 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 te I'm telling you what we're doing. I'm doing a Stevie Wonder tribute show. Oh, dude, that's awesome. Yeah. So we're doing, I'm, you know, I'm working on that now. And uh, also, the piano player that I'm going to have used to be part of the Johnny Guitar Watson band, too. Oh, didn't that's know, incredible. Did not know that he lived in South Carolina. My brother said, hey, uh, wow. such and such lives in Columbia. So when my brother came out, Last time, you know, we sat down and had lunch with him, and you know, so I said, "Man, I would love to give him and Jerry, which is my brother." I said, "On a gig." So he's going to do the twenty third at Columbia. Then that Sunday we'll be in Atlanta. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, doing St. James Live. Yeah. So, but what? But what we're doing is uh, we're doing the music of Stevie Wonder. So uh, a tribute of all of his music. Uh, I call cool. it. I call it. Uh, from a guitarist perspective, Paul Dozier presents the music of Stevie Wonder. Oh, that's awesome. And you yeah. know, Paul, I wanted to ask you, man, because mm -hmm. your, some of your recordings, you've got, of course, one of your singles. And, and, and again, I hate that I'm limited to the catalog on Spotify because yeah. you've got a whole bunch of other stuff that I haven't heard. Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel like I'm missing out, but, I, as, but I'm referencing Spotify. You do the Commodore's Lady, You Bring Me Up. That was your last recording. You did it yep. this year. It has a copyright date of 2024. Yes, that's uh, my latest yeah. single. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. And and uh, how do how do you, how do you get permission to do tunes like that? Is it is there a, a catalog that's available for everyone? Free rights, or did you have well, to reach out and ask? Or 
How does that well, work? Well, you know what? Nowadays, man, it's not like a way. It's not like how it used to be because everything is streaming. Mm-hmm. And so the thing is, if you are printing up, they only are concerned if you are, say, CDs, which are about to go out the door. Yeah. Right? <laughs> CD. So, yeah, right. uh, so the thing is, they're they're only concerned about sales. So mm-hmm. if I'm an artist and I'm selling ten, you know, like a million or fifty thousand units, then they'll come after you. As oh, far really? As producing. Yeah, but they say if you're only printing up like less than a thousand CDs, which I'm okay. not printing up anything. Everything is uh-huh. streaming. You're okay. So if you're streaming, you could have 50,000 streams and they're still not going to come after you. Right. Interesting. And, yeah, and, and then, of course, because, you, know why? because mm-hmm. you don't, you know, you don't make any money from streaming. That's right. Now, and and you I don't. Did, that's a good question. You don't from your your catalog on Spotify. You're not making any residuals on that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about. Oh, yes. You know, like on my original music, I am. Mm-hmm. OK. Yeah, but you know, when I do a cover, you know, the thing is, I'll give them credit. Hey, this song is, you know, uh, the guy who wrote the song was a member of the Commodores. It wasn't Lionel Richie's, uh, William King or something like that. Okay. Oh, so, you know, uh, uh, you know, YouTube music knows that those credits. Right. Are, so, and if it does blow up, he gets the royalty for it. I don't care. I just like the song. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I and then on your you have one full album on spotify yeah and that was um recorded in uh 2018 brand new day yes and yeah you've got nine tracks on there and i didn't realize it but i was listening to one and i went hey i know that tune and it was no ordinary love by sade yep i did a spin on that one and um i i dig it it's it's got like a dude there's like this funky almost a wah-wah thing or yeah, some, some funky thing on your guitar that you're doing. It really stands off from all the other tracks. Yeah, really exactly. Stuff. You know, hey, I'm not doing it the traditional way. I'm, I, I just kind of like I took uh, the one line. Uh, I made that go through all the song. OK, and so the foundation of the music is just playing. You know, the bass is just doing whole notes. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Uh-huh. You know, so, and uh you know because i just like to switch things up a little bit you know the kind of you know if i'm going to cover a song i don't want to do it exactly like it you know so yeah that was my 2018 album my last full album um so um and then from there i put out loads of singles um probably around maybe a single every year since then and um one of my favorite singles is uh uh dancing by the sea yeah dancing by the sea dancing by the sea and and i really dig it because the solo in that man it's like it sparkles it has this really you know you've got this cool mellow tone that i dig and a lot of um you know the 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 octave the octave chords like west montgomery style a lot of you know playing around in that uh but this one that it really jumped out at me it's yeah. a beautiful tune. What what year was that? Dancing I by the did, Sea. Yeah, I did Dancing by the Sea. That had to be man, when, when did I do that? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's, that's on your album. Album. That's on your album, 2018, Dancing by the Sea. Okay. Yeah. So it had to be around that time. And uh I think it's see did I put that on the album? Yeah, and I'm telling you, Paul, it's the track according to Spotify that gets the most plays on that album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it it did well. You know what I mean. You know, Spotify. Um, but uh, going back to my tone, uh, just to let your listeners know, I don't play with a pick. You know, you and I didn't talk about that. I didn't realize that. That that gives you that really warm, meaty. Yeah. You know that that like West Montgomery and his thumb. Yeah, I've know? never I never adapted to a pick, Patrick. Never did. I hey, you know, when I was younger, I said, wait a minute. I gotta learn how to play with a pick. Everybody else plays with a pick. And you okay. know what? And I just said, you know what? This thing is coming real, real easy for me not to play with a pick. I said so. Cause I didn't know it, it wasn't until many years later that I knew that West Montgomery didn't play with a pick. Right. I was an adult. I'm like, wait a minute. You don't play with a pick. I said, uh-huh. kidding me. So I was cool after that, man, you know. So 
it's, it's not a whole lot of us. Where, what are you playing? Like your index finger and thumb? What, what are you just whatever fingers available? Yeah, I, you know, I, I developed this style. It's somewhat like it's my thumb, and then I have somewhat uh, like a finger style. Okay. Type of pick, you know, to where, you know, I basically, you know, it all depends on the riff that I'm doing. Sure. You know what I mean? But but for the most part, when I'm playing just notes and everything, it's just all thumb. And I'm looking back on it. When you came to pick up your strap from me, I always let the client sit down at their guitar and plug it in, see how mm. they like the feel. And, mm. I, and I always offer them a pick because I've got like 50 different guitar picks with different thicknesses. And I ask yeah. them what kind of pick they like. And you know what? I do remember you not needing a pick. And right. I was like, just listen to what you're doing going, God dang, he's so smooth, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knows, he, it's, that's his playing style. Yeah, that's my playing style, man. And, you know, people today, they, they're like, man, this dude don't use a pick. You know, and I could get pretty fast, you know, uh, you know, with it. It's, it's just, uh, just something I just developed. You know, like I said, I started out not playing with the pick as a little kid. So it was just kind of mm -hmm. like, Jesus, you know, I mean, we're talking 50. I won't tell my age, but, you know. <laughs> you I, think that, it, come, that comes from playing bass as a young kid, too? Your finger finger yeah. style bass, right? The, the yeah. index well, and the middle finger. Well, well, I started playing bass with my thumb only. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, because, uh, shoot, my fingers were so short, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good you know, point. Yeah, I'm kind of like, man, I can't. Because, yeah. man, when I started playing bass, man, I had to learn to, uh, I, I laid the bass on my lap. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? And, you know, I, like I said, I was a little guy, you know. And then as I got older, then I developed the finger, you know, the two fingers and, you know, and, and so forth. When you but, guys um, went to the studio, you had the bass strapped on, I'm sitting in your lap on that first album that you guys cut? Well, actually, uh, I didn't record uh, guitar in the studio. I was too young. Because I oh, have another okay. brother who played bass. Oh, I got you. It was much later on some of the other records that I played. I got uh, you. Yeah, but uh, when I, you know, that young, no, my dad was just, no, I was in the studio singing lead vocals, you know what I mean? Guitar Garage Talk is brought to you by YourGuitarMechanic.com setups, repairs, restrings, and more. Whatever your guitar or bass needs, we can get it done. Offering pickup and delivery service in the greater Charlotte, North Carolina area. YourGuitarMechanic.com Now, back to the program. So like on the 45, good. so like uh -huh. on the 45, my dad would be lead singing a song and then on the uh -huh. other, you know, B side, it would be featuring me. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, as a guitar player, uh, the one thing that you do to compensate for uh, speed, uh, if you're playing with your fingers, your speed is obviously less than if you have a pick. So you end up learning how to hammer on and pull off and yes. doing a lot of a lot of the trills and yep. stuff. You're adding more notes on the, with the left hand than you are the right. That's Did it. You, so, yeah. So do you find that you, you become more of a explorer of the fretboard and, and out of necessity uh that's it, it separates you from a standard guitar player i think As, definitely and that's how you do it because um you got it right on because you know that picking style you have to you know it's the it, you know yeah you know it's yeah. that so yeah, yeah. when you play with your thumb it has to be a lot of this absolutely you know absolutely. what i mean and so, yeah, so I developed it, and that's how I, you know, able to keep up with some of these guys who play fast, you know. Now, I, you know, of course, I don't get into all that sweeping stuff, sweeping, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't find myself having any challenges um, keeping up, you know, like I said, because I'm going to be me regardless. And uh, and people kind of like that, you know what yeah. I mean? You know, you know, You know, a lot of guys I play for, you know, they appreciate me really just playing the music. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you showing know, up with the music charted out. <laughs> exactly. You know, you know, I have, I have this theory, and I expect that from people, you know, to give me the same respect. But I say, I come to serve the music and not myself. There you go. You know what I mean? I'm not Absolutely. here. I'm not here to check out my shops. Uh -huh. you, know, you know, you know, and and the guy looking at you crazy. You know, they they just want you to play the music. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know so many guys that uh, in past times have gotten fired from major gigs because they played they, they're just all over the place. What was but, the what uh, was the one backup you did where it was like, oh, I wish I could do this every night. This guy's uh, phenomenal. And, oh yeah, and, I mean, you know, uh, saxophonist Jeff Kashawa. Okay. Uh, Paul Taylor was great. Yeah. Um, were a lot of these in Charlotte at the Middle Sea or Detroit, LA? Yeah, so it's a combination of Detroit. Okay. okay. You know, yeah, you know, when I was in Detroit, I did even some R and B stuff. I did some Motown stuff, uh, uh Martha and the Vandellas. Oh wow, wow. Yeah, I did uh the spinners. Did you ever go uh, tour those old studios in Detroit that that, yes. that made his yeah? Is it yeah, you can feel it, right? The history there. Oh yeah, huge, the Motown huge respect. Oh yeah, man, the Motown studio is still there. You can tour there. Uh, United Sound is another major one. Uh, 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 Aretha Franklin used to uh, record a lot there. Oh. Um, there was one more. I think they had closed it down. And because uh, they had closed down United Sound also. Some of the older ones are not up and running. They had really only one major studio there called Studio A. Okay. And uh, that was what a lot of the... Uh, uh, talent would come and record there, like Anita Baker would record there. Uh, Kirk William would come in and record there. Nice. Bob James, you know, Bob mm-hmm. James would come in and record there. You know, it was a major. It was like one of the last major studios. Uh, and then, Man, right before oh. I left, uh-huh. they closed down. Yeah. Oh wow, wow. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, I'm going to see. I'm going to see Bob James in uh, at the. Uh, Norfolk Jazz Festival in Virginia in August. Oh, that's great! Yeah, man. He, yeah. You know, yeah, he that's that's going to be a good show. Now, is he by? Because you know, Bob James, he's with, um, you know, he's ha- <clears throat> he has uh, different sets that he does. I know he's with Four Play. He has Bob James Trio. Now, which one are you going to see? Well, it's not Four Play because I'd be super super excited about that. But I think it okay. just might be his trio then. Okay, yeah, probably just probably yeah. You know, yeah, and and Norman Brown's going to be there too. Okay, yeah, you know yeah. Norman. Is at, yeah, he's at Middle C a lot. Um, and I've missed him. Mm-hmm. I'm bummed out about that. I'd love to see that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so my side man experiences still are going on. You know, I, I pick and choose right now. You know, um, but I, you know, I'm kind of like gearing to just started to work on my own shows more now. Okay. I've kind of been, you know, I've been in Charlotte now for almost ten years, and I kind of got a feel of some guys that that uh, respect me, and I mm-hmm. respect them. You know, it has mm-hmm. to be that respect between both sides. So, mm-hmm. uh, so um, I'm going to be gearing up doing more of my own shows and doing a lot of the side man stuff. You know. Well, that, that's an uh, then that, that that makes me wonder uh, what do you think your because your gigs. None of them are in Charlotte. What, what do you think about the scene here? Do you think it's it's kind of anemic? I mean, we got the middle sea, but gee, that's mm. kind of about it. That's yeah. about it. That yeah, that's that's really it. That's just all they have, which is sad because when you have one place that's really doing it, the problem is, and I've had this happen all of my career, you have something called gatekeepers. Mm. And you have these guys who have been living here, you know, all their lives. And, you know, and they are the guys that make sure that you're not a coming, you're not going to come in and take their gig. Mm, okay. and, you know, and you know what I mean? And, you know, and I made noise when I first got here, you know, it didn't take me long for it to spray. Hey, there's a new guitar player in town. Okay. <laughs> you know okay. what I mean? It, it, it didn't take long. So, uh, you know, when I got on the scene and then a lot of folks somewhat got envious to the fact that, okay. that, you know, a lot of people were seeking me out to do things, you know what I mean? Because it's not just my playing, because I believe the great, there's a package that comes with being a musician. Mm-hmm. It's a full package. And one thing my dad taught us was to be the full package. First of all, yes, you're going to be skillful. You're going to get the gig because people think you can handle the gig. But what about your character? You know what I mean? What about how you dress? What about how 
being on time. Wow. Because I'm on gigs, man, where guys bring chaos. They're great musicians, mm -hmm. but they bring drama. Mm. They bring chaos. And they look like they just got out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. serious. I am mm -hmm. so serious. Uh, uh, Patrick, I said to myself, is this a young thing or what? I said, because, mm -hmm. dude, you're in tennis shoes and a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, middle C is kind of like an upscale it's club. Pretty, you know? pretty, pretty classy, yeah. I've yeah been exactly. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, dude, you know. Give it but, a little bit of thought and care. Yeah. I said, so a lot of these musicians come with, you know, they're not the full package. Mm. You know what I mean? So if I hire a guy to come on my show, I lay it down. I said, listen, you're not coming in tennis shoes, man. Yeah. I'm not going to make you wear a suit, but you're not coming mm -hmm. in tennis <laughs> you, mm -hmm. know? you know what I mean? And it's kind of like, wow. And it's usually the drummer. Usually the drummer. I don't know what it is about drummers. They just feel like they can just come without combing their hair. You know, I hate to know, say it, Paul, but the drummers have always known that they're the hired guns. Everyone <laughs> needs a good drummer. If you can play multiple drummers and you're a good drummer, mm -hmm. I think they kind of, speaking of that word diva, I think if you're a damn good drummer and people know it and they want you in that gig, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but that, that's probably what they're thinking. Like, I don't need to get all spruced up. They, they're exactly. getting what they're getting, you know? Hey, man. And, you know, and like I said, it could be the piano player. I've seen something like, dude, bass player. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but, you know, it's just all about being the full package, man. And That's um, cool. That's very cool. And, you know, that's how I was raised, you know. So sometimes I'm on a gig and, you know, they're looking at me out of envy. You know, this guy's, and, you know, but the guy that we're playing for, He's going to be nice, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know and, and you look like a bum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thing is, and, and I've had people say, hey, man, I, I, I like what you got on. And, you know, everybody looking at me like out of envy, you know, I'm like, man, what is it? It's generation gap or something. <laughs> uh, hey, that's, you know, they didn't have the work ethic that your dad instilled in you guys. Yeah, man. But even, yeah, you know, but it was just during the time because when I was coming up, everybody had that standard. Yeah, right. Across the board, nobody came mm -hmm. looking like you know. It's just it's really the generation, man. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. And you know that right. when you perform with your brother, he's going to bring that same attitude. Almost oh, definitely. That's mm -hmm. why I told him. I said, "Hey, man, you could come here once a year, and I'll just do live gigs once a year." <laughs> I said, yeah, because, there you go. You know what I mean? I said because I don't care. You know, I don't want to have to figure out who I want to use. You know, I said, "Yeah, mm -hmm. this down here, you know." He can play, but he has a, you know, he's always late. You know what I mean? I don't. Yeah. yeah. You know, and boy, being late is the thing. Oh, God. Uh, and I can tell you had that that good. You were you were messaging me this morning about this show, and, yeah. and in actuality, we're an hour early. You know, yeah. I mean, you were you were. I could tell you were preparing just for this interview, so oh, I yeah. can tell that you have that work ethic instilled in you. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm old school. Call me old school. Call me, you, you know, go. whatever. And I accept that, man, because I'm not going to fall for what's going on right now. I mean, like, mm -hmm. no way. You know, so, 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 yeah, I was preparing. I was thinking about this Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I, I said, yeah. okay, you know, since, since, let me get, you know, I said, you know, we're just going to flow, but, you know, I'm going to have my ducks in a row. You know, I was just going to tell my story. Awesome. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know what it's all about, man, you know. And well, so, and, right. it, and and I'm thinking about the, you know, we we're talking about the anemic scene here in Charlotte. And that's just sad that there's those gatekeepers out there. And, uh, oh, oh, there's a new dog in town. I'm threatened. You know and what, music it's, shouldn't be that way, man. It should be a sharing experience. But you know what, man? I thought about something. It's on mm -hmm. the corporate jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's on your nine to fives. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, they're everywhere. But... Mm -hmm. In the music scene, man, is this kind of like, dude, you know, uh, you're trying to block me because you don't want me to outshine you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you know, it, it's crazy. And I said, but you know what? They don't understand. They can't. And but see, the thing is, they know they can't stop me because I'm self-contained. I don't hire musicians on my album. I play everything. Mm-hmm. I write my music. I produce my music, and I perform my music. If you're the whole package, and you've got, you should not. Uh, you're 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 an ultimate, ultimate yeah. threat and an ultimate go-to guy. I mean, right. It's, and you if know, they want if they want to be, you know part of the scene, then they need to probably up their game a little bit. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, and, and, and these are very good players I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there are, you know, a lot of insecurity in some of these musicians, and that's just their character. You know, they just uh-huh. don't want, they don't want you to be the guy that's, especially a new guy in Sharp. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know you, know what I mean? you know what I'm thinking about, Paul? And I'm thinking about one of the things, one of the cool things about jazz, especially in the mm-hmm. history of jazz, is it was based on a family. We are a group of musicians who have approached a very different brand of music. I'm talking back in the 50s and 60s. And and, and you'll always see dudes inviting other, other dudes on stage to yep. be on their albums. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's a it's a it's a family and it's a tight knit community, okay. and it's kind of, it, it, you know, how they always say jazz is kind of it's not dying, but it's really getting hit a gut punch. It's a oh, really yeah. hard hard industry to be a part of because it it's not it's not in the mainstream, and exactly. and it's sad that that inner inner fighting and and envy enviousness and stuff like that it it, it it's it doesn't help. It doesn't help the cause at all. Exactly. It, it's it, kind of sad. It, it's sad. And but see, the thing is, I, I think what it is, uh, systematically, you know, the system just where things that you were, the system has taken it, has destroyed it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know, it's just all about making money. It's just all about mm-hmm. money. It's not, it's not mm-hmm. about the music anymore. Mm-hmm. It's about money only. <laughs> What club are you playing in Atlanta? St. James Live, one of the biggest jazz clubs. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Never got I to, I lived, I lived in Marietta there and I went to a couple clubs, the Velvet mm-hmm. Note. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I never did visit St. James. I did hear yeah. a lot of good things. Yeah. I played at St. James quite a few times as a, as a backup guy, you know, touring with some of these smooth jazz guys there. So, okay. Well, so this would be my first show there as a solo artist. Very cool. Yeah, you, you know, which is great. I was I was really blessed to get the gig, you, you know, but she uh I guess she knew about me and uh see I I'm I've always been under the radar and mm-hmm. I'm cool and I'm cool with that. You know, mm-hmm. because you know, I, you know, hey, the thing is I'm not gonna change to be from up from under the radar, you know what I mean? I'm not gonna change. Sure. Right. You know what I mean? I'm gonna hey, because hey, I have a responsibility for the gift God has given me, the, the music yeah. he gives me. Yeah. It affects people. It always has. At least people Absolutely, totally man. affected by it. So I said, so why am I going to change it? Because I'm trying to please the, you know, just please the status quo. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. You know, no. so. Uh, Good for yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be true to myself. Right, Patrick. You know yeah. what I mean? So, so that's what it's all about. So, hey, you know, um, I'm enjoying myself still. I'm getting older. I'm still going to be playing. By the way, I purchased me a new saxophone not too long ago, so I'm trying to get back on it. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, I'd, love, so, I'd love to hear it sometime, man. Yeah, man. You know, um, you know. Well, well, some of the solos, if you hear on uh, some of my um, recordings, uh-huh. if you hear the saxophone taking a solo, that's me. No doubt. What? Yeah. What? Can you name any tracks that? Uh, yeah. that I would. Uh, you could go to. You could go to a song called Reset. Oh, I dig reset. That's one of my favorite singles, man. It really stands okay. out. Okay. All right. so, so I'm playing I'm playing saxophone on that. You're uh, okay, so that's the one where someone is you're doubling the lines on the guitar. Yes. And I thought I heard a synthesizer, but that's you on sax. Yes.
dude, okay, because it's it's kind of blended back. The guitar yep. is the focus. The yes. back behind it, there's someone following your line. That's yep. you. That's cool. That that makes sense. And also, grat- and, and uh, the song Gratified. Okay, Gratified, cool. Yeah, Gratified, I'm doing a saxophone on that too. So, see, see, I was type of guy, it's funny, man, <laughs> because I hadn't played in years, man, but uh, my son-in-law, where I record, you know, he, he had a saxophone laying around. And uh, I said, man, you know, I know my mechanics are still there. I said, let me see if I could put a solo in this. And and it just blew me away. I said, man, I, could, I guess I could still play a little bit. You know what I mean? And uh, I said, I'm not nearly where I used to be. I said, but mm. I can make this work. So, you know, I mean, I'm you know, I'm no <clears throat> Kenny G on it, but mm-hmm. hey, people are like, that's your plan? I said, he said, man, you should play. I said, well, you know, I, I, I personally don't really have a sax right now. So I went out and bought me a new one. And, uh, you know, so I'm Getting my, it's gonna, you know, I'm not rushing. I'm trying to get my jaw back, you know, my armature. Sure. You know, yeah. Oh, but definitely. you know, my, but you know, my articulation, you know, I'm still kind of getting that back. But uh, if I need to like just do a little spot something on a saxophone, oh yeah, I can still do, you know, I can do that. Wouldn't that be cool to have like a tribute concert where you're doing like West Montgomery tunes on the saxophone or something like that? Yes. Wouldn't that be interesting if George Benson on a saxophone or something? Most definitely. But see, that's what I do. That's why I call it, Paul, you know, from a guitarist perspective, because yeah. I do, I can do a saxophone tribute on guitar. Yes. Oh, that'd be cool, too. Oh, yeah, I've done it. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, I've done all Grover songs, you know what I mean? And uh, and so, you know, I that's what I do. I just, you know, you know, like when I tribute, I'm. I'm very rarely tributing guitar players. Uh It's either singers or other instruments. Uh, Yeah, I'll do piano stuff. You know, well, like hence your Stevie Wonder tribute. You're going to be doing piano lines on the guitar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm just uh, vibing his vocals because remember, I was a vocalist first. That's right. Yeah. So I understand the approach of a vocalist. So the thing is, so, you know, I'm known around Charlotte as being able to comp a vocal uh, standard on the guitar. What are some of the Stevie tracks that you're going to cover? Like Superstition oh, and all of it, man. Too High as Superstition, I Wish. All the hits, man. I'm, the show is going to be a 90 minute show. So Whoa, uh, nice. I got like 14 to 15 songs we'll be doing. Sweet. Oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, man. So, uh, hey, if you're not doing it on the 23rd, if you want to make the drive out to Columbia, it's a nice jazz club, man. It's a nice little, yeah, very the, the Chase, Chase Lounge. Yeah, Chase Lounge, downtown. Uh, August 23rd. Yeah, 23rd. Hey, so, we're, so talking about the family, and mm-hmm. and uh, you, you mentioned your son-in-law, and, yep. and uh your daughter sings on on, a, on one track or multiple tracks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you're hearing any female background vocals on some of the tracks, that's my daughter. I was wondering about background. Yeah. But, and and what, but, what's her name? Okay. Well, let me see. Jessica I'm tell Ray? You. Yeah. Jessica Ray is one of my daughters, but I have an older daughter, which is my, um, which is my, um, Son-in-law, you know, my daughter's married to my son-in-law who records me. Okay. She's my oldest. She sings too. As a matter of fact, she's singing background vocals on um, the Sade song. Uh, uh, Jessica. Oh, really? Okay, cool. That's my oldest daughter. Now, Jessica does most of my vocals. She's doing the um, Only With You. And what else is she? She's doing a couple more songs. Um, I Dream in Color. Yes, I dream in color. That's her. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Um, just anything, basically, you're hearing background vocals on. She's singing. How about I, you? Because there's there's some male background vocals too back there. Yeah, that's me. Is that you? Yes. Excellent, man. Would yeah. you do that if you did your shows live? You'd you'd be maybe invite yeah, her yeah. on stage and. Yeah, uh, she doesn't travel with me much, but sometimes, you know, she has done like Shay's Lounge with me, you know, and she, yeah, she's kind of busy right now doing, you know, like the jobs and stuff. Great voice. You know, yeah, you know, she wants to sing. 
out, but it's, it's not really a push, you know. But so she's it's a hard good. business, is it not? It's and, a hard business. Yes, and you know, and she's very no nonsense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, she's no nonsense. So she, she, she'd rather just say, hey, I'll just uh, do some stuff on my own. I'm getting ready to do a few songs on her. Uh, we're going to do like, a, like an acoustic thing where it's just vocals and acoustic. Nice. nice. Yeah, so uh, matter of fact, because uh, you know, she's a writer, so she writes. Um, uh, matter of fact, she wrote the lyrics to o Only With You. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah, she wrote the lyrics. Uh, I just, she, she brought me the song and I put the music to it. Nice. And would yeah. acoustic be on that guitar right behind you there on the wall? Was it, would that be the one you pick right back there? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that one right there. Cool. Yeah, but I just picked up another uh, nylon acoustic uh, last year. Uh, I really is that the, is that the Godin you told me about? No, it's a. Uh, what's, what's it called? I don't know if you can see this thing. Oh uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Look at that, man. Yeah, gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> next side of it. Okay. Oh, you so know, it's got uh, active active pickup at the battery, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you know, his head, you know, headstock. Super cool, man. Yeah, I love yeah. it, man. You know, you know, so this is the one that I'll be I'll be playing quite a bit of, you know, on this one. You know, I've been had the nylon Yamaha for years. Mm -hmm. You know, which is a great guitar also. So I just said I need to get me another one, you know, and uh, I saw this <laughs> You can never have too many. Yeah, you know, I I, I can't buy any more guitars, man. I, you know, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I said, you know, if you only play a couple of them, man, I forget the ones that, you know, I, I got a, an arch top back there, a Pat Metheny that I bought years ago. Oh, I, don't know. I, I only break that out when I'm doing like a swing, jazz, you know, gig, and that's very rare. Very cool. So, yeah. So how about amplifiers of choice? What do you, what do you, what do you have for that? Well, I have always been a uh, Fender Twin Reverb guy. Okay. And I have one that I rarely take up because it's too darn heavy for me right now. <laughs> oh, no doubt, man. Those things are beasts. And they oh, have like yeah. the steel arms on the side that, that rock yep. back so you can tilt yep. it back. Yeah, but man, that thing is so heavy. So I've had it for, God, maybe seven years, and I think I've taken it out three times. So it's whatever sound system they have going on on stage is you'll, you'll just plug into yeah, you know, a lot of times when I do these gigs, they have backline, and nine mm. times they have a Fender Twin. My yeah. other go-to uh, for years was a Roland JC. Oh, okay. Yeah, jazz I, chorus. I, yeah, yeah, I used mm -hmm. to use that quite a bit. Uh, but I, I got an amp that I take around that's pretty light. It's by Acoustic. They came out with uh, some amplifiers, some guitar amplifiers with two twelves in it. Nice. You know, and uh, it kind of reminds me of the JC. So when I go oh, out okay. and I need an amp. I take that. I love it. Do you use the built-in chorus, or do you have any pedals? Oh, I have I have pedals, but it has built-in stuff in it too. But I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I I rarely use that because I have a small set of pedals that I use. What What do you What do you prefer for your pedals? Man, I, you know, I'm a clean guy. I don't use mm -hmm. a. I I use a. I use a digital delay. I use a chorus. Um, I have a reverb. Um, box that i use also and i have a wah what's your a wah really yeah it's a it's a small um what's the name of that thing it's a popular one um it's not a morley it's um uh, like a dunlop or a crybaby yeah but it's a miniature one. you ever oh, seen interesting this yeah uh -huh. they have the big ones but they uh -huh. have ones that might be <laughs> Do you, about and, and and what do, what do you do with that? Do you find yourself like choking the notes out and set it at like a mid position and then leave it alone, or or do you actually because where where do you incorporate the wah in your in your stuff? Uh well, I don't I don't use a wah in Paul Dozier's music. I got the pedal board for when I do the sideman stuff. I got you. Okay. Yeah, because I'm a, yeah I'm a whole nother thing when it's Paul Dozier music. It's just that. These smooth jazz guys want distortion, and they want. Uh, okay. You won't hear distortion in Paul Dozier's music. 
I got you. Well, good for you. That means you're armed and ready no matter what the performance oh, yeah. requires. Oh, yeah. I got yeah. you. Because I, yeah. I was like, where the heck is he using Wawa? And, and... Yeah, no, you know, smooth jazz. I mean, well, if I use Wawa, it'll be in my recordings where it's in the rhythm. You know, gotcha. like on yeah, yeah, like on Danks, yeah, like on Danksen by the Sea. I think the Wawa, I guess some Wawa happened in there. Okay. Um, okay. But yeah, so yeah, so the pedal board is really I and really to be honest with you, I didn't play with a pedal board until I moved to Detroit and I joined this fusion band. And um and uh, I said, okay, fusion, I kind of gotta get some distortion. Gotta get the bells and whistles going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, said, I don't like distortion, but uh, you know, it was all good. Well, so, this, so, that, so that begs the question. You do record a, the Paul Dozier is a smooth jazz guitar player. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But are, are there any genres that you wish you could dabble in? And you know what? I think I might want to do a fusion recording or well, I mean, what'd you, yes. what'd you think about being in a fusion act? What, what, what kind of stuff did you guys do? Original? Oh, God. Oh, well, well, we were air. Uh, we were definitely an original band. We, we wrote all of our own material. We recorded a couple of albums. Wow. Um, what, yeah, where can I find these albums? I'm a, kind of, fusion, I'm a fusion fan. I'd love oh, well, to track them. I don't know. See, man, back then, let me see. This was in 97, 8, around that time. Okay. And I don't, you know, like I said, the Spotify stuff, I don't even know when that stuff came out. So I don't even think, I have some physical copies. I would have to get, see if I can find some physical copies. And I would just give you a physical copy of a CD. Oh, Paul, if you did, oh, yeah. I'm telling oh, you, yeah. I'd be in heaven, man. Oh, no, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll give you some of my other stuff. Also in physical copies that's not on Spotify because I got tons. So oh, you know, I just, yeah, yeah, yo, know, hey man, most definitely. So, um, but yeah, but when I got in that group, uh, we were an original band and we wrote all of our own material. I'll find awesome. some stuff on YouTube and I'll send it to you. You can see us in action. Oh, back please there. do, please do. Yeah, yeah, and then um, uh, so yeah, so as far as pedal boards, like I said. That's only mm -hmm. for the side. That's mainly for the side man stuff. So you're so you're armed and ready. Yeah. Yeah, armed and ready to go with that. You know, I'm ready as a bass player. As a matter of fact, I just did a bass gig this past weekend. And people didn't know I played bass. <laughs> <laughs> they do but now. see the thing is, I'm gonna tell you who do know that I played bass was the gatekeepers. They know yeah. I played bass. Uh oh, uh oh. And, and that, so you're and an and saxophone, so you're that triple threat that just came into town. Hey man, listen, <laughs> it, you know, I, it, it's all good, man. You know, I, I, I'm just going for whatever you know the ride that I'm on. You know, what I mean, people can, yeah. you know, it, it, listen. There's enough room for everybody. That's absolutely correct, Paul. So when you record, you don't have to go in the studio anymore, right? You're doing you're doing your tracks from home. Is that well, no, I go to no, no, I go to my son-in-law. He has a he has a small studio. And and so like when you did your your full album, Brand New Day, yeah, uh, did did you go to him? Yep. Oh, nice, nice. And does yep. he do the final mix? How, how long yep. does that take? Do you sit down with him and go, can you, oh, can you punch oh, yeah. that I, in? Or oh yeah, man. Most of the thing more? is, he's more. He's a young guy. He's only thirty five, and you know he records other stuff besides jazz and smooth jazz. So I have to see. I'm the ears. He's the button pusher. He's the navigator, which means that, mm -hmm. you know, all that computer software stuff, I don't even care about learning. Mm -hmm. So so the thing is, uh, when I produce my stuff, I make sure that I'm doing it the old school way. Okay. So as far as pannings and the frequencies, you know, making sure mm -hmm. everything is where mm -hmm. it's supposed to be. So I'm helping him as he's helping me, you know. So I got him trained right now on how, <laughs> you know, how I like my guitar. Because uh -huh. man, at first, because man, when we first started, I'm like, oh God, I do better at home on my four track. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, man, uh, I'm like, okay, look, dude, yeah, uh, you know, you know, this is where we're going with the Pro Tools and all of this kind of logic stuff. I said, okay, uh -huh. but. I don't understand. I don't know how to navigate this stuff. So sure. I got to help you. You know how to navigate this stuff upside down, but you don't uh -huh. know how to, you know, I said, my theory is this, just because it sounds good don't mean it's right. Interesting. You know what I mean? Because in the studio. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, yeah because in the studio, you know, you think, oh, man, that sounds great. 
And then uh-huh. you hear it on, and then you hear it from that digital suppressed yeah. situation yeah. on your phone. Right. And it sounds like Nothing. Yeah, yeah, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's gotta like, hey, you know, so I say, hey, listen, man, we gotta get some nice speakers in here. I said, we're doing it the old school way. Excellent. Because it's all about the final what it's supposed to sound like. You know, let's there take you. a copy out to the car and listen to it in the car. Cool. You know what I mean? I said, you know, we're not trusting headphones and, you know, what you think it sounds like. See, so my experience of being in the studio for years is helping him. I said, no, that Tom is not right. No, no the Tom is not, you know, I was with him yesterday because I'm working on some tracks for some shows I got to do. I got to do a, a show in Detroit next month. So um, just working on some stuff. And so just trying to, you know, get him to understand that, you know, when you're uh, mixing live musicians, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, live live instruments is a lot different than mixing that, you know, that's. Is you know, he going to be doing your soundboard? No, no, oh, okay. no, no, no. He doesn't travel with you. Or do that. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, he just. Oh, he live, just live in the studio. Yeah, I'm sorry. Live in the studio. Gotcha. OK. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's your so, dad. So, there's your dad's work ethic coming in too. Again, oh, man, hey, it's my dad's and all of the peers that I grew Res- up with coming respect up. Respect for the music, yeah, oh, absolutely. Man, that's what it was all about, and then that's where it, that's where it's got to yeah. be. Uh, yeah, we absolutely. totally lost that. It mm-hmm. is, you know, when guys show up unprepared, you know what I mean, on gigs, and you pay thirty five, forty bucks for. You want to see a well rehearsed band. Right, that's right. That's gather and in harmony and in sync. You don't see that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where do you think? Where do you think smooth jazz is going? It, it because it, it seems like it's remained unchanged for a while now. Well, I'm gonna tell you where it's going, and it's already it went from smooth jazz now to R and B tribute stuff. Okay. There's so many smooth jazz guys now are going back and doing tribute to the 70s groups, like, you know, tribute to Michael Jackson's music, tribute to this and that. On the small, on the. And, why and do you think that is? Is that why you decided to do a tribute to Stevie Wonder? Because well, it's kind of where smooth jazz is going. So I might as well jump on that bandwagon. Or? I'm saying, I'm saying yes and no to that. I'm saying okay. yes. I'm doing it because. Stevie Wonder was one of my record mentors. I was fascinated by his writing and his music. Cool. But, but the other thing is this. You're doing it out of respect and homage to, to her. Most to her definitely. Okay. Yeah, you're not I, you know, doing just, it out of commercial reasoning, which oh, is no. what you're trying to get at. That's smooth jazz exactly. direction speaking. I got you. Right. And, and I'm going to tell you where the shift has happened with smooth jazz. If you ever go and see a smooth jazz concert now, say a festival, Mm -hmm. you may have a few smooth jazz guys, but Mm -hmm. you better believe you're going to have some old school R&B guys like Jeffrey Osborne, Peebo Bryson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those those guys are not necessarily jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, Shaka Khan, Mm -hmm. Sheila E. You know, I went to, you know, it's a big jazz fest that happens every year in Florida called the uh, Seabreeze Jazz Fest. Oh, yeah, sure. I know that one. Yeah, I did it. I was a featured artist back in 2012 on that one. Cool. Yeah, I did it back then. So uh, so I visited there, man, and I said, man, it's a lot of R&B, old school R&B, you know, Interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. you may have Earth, Wind, and Fire, you know. And, and I, I said, so smooth jazz has now has like i said they have turned into solely somewhat r&b instrumental Mm, old school mm -hmm. instrumental Mm. r&b you're not getting much jazz anymore Mm. and and do you think that's because they're trying to get listeners yep and butts in the seats Uh, uh, If, if if they recognize the tunes that we're doing Yes. Then we've got their attention, and then that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. They don't really care about your original stuff. Yeah. Because you know what? 
there's no more radio for them to get, you know, for them to hear that stuff on a rotation during the day, like a Mr. Magic, how we used to do back mm-hmm, in the day. Mm-hmm, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, I heard Mr. Magic on the radio station called KKGO in LA, maybe three or four times during the day. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, but you, we don't have, but we don't have that anymore. Uh-huh. So, so, so the thing is now, you have to, you know, they have to say, well, we, you know, something has to change. So they're saying, well, let's go back to some of this music that these listeners were always, it's embedded with, you know, within them because they was always mm. li- hearing it. Mm. And uh, this will be the crowd that we attract. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, man, when you go to Seabreeze, the average age at Seabreeze, I'm going to say 50 years old. Sure. The, the, 10, the people that yeah that remember yeah ten thousand people they pack it out every year yeah I said to myself ah see this is what this is all about <laughs> yeah there's nobody younger than forty there you know that's an interesting interesting perspective on it you know I went up to the um, Montreal Jazz Festival last year and mm-hmm. I think I told you this when we first sat down and talked and there were there's hip hop hip hop crossed in. Jazz to, to the Montreal to the festivals now is kind of a catchphrase. Yeah, you know it's not going to be pure jazz. I went I mean, to see George Benson before yes. the guy before he retires. Yeah, uh, and 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 it was it was close, man. I, I've come to find out, you know, he only played guitar for just a few of his tunes. He's got a mm-hmm. great backup band. He's got that guitarist that's been with him for decades. Yeah, but him a long time. Yeah, yeah, and and mm-hmm. great guitarist too. And yeah, uh, and it uh, come to find out, I read later. I was like, "What?" Well, I was I was reassuring my wife. I'm like, "Look, he really is a phenomenal guitar player. <laughs> you have to yeah. believe me, even though he hasn't been playing a lot during this this concert." Come mm-hmm. to find out, he fell and injured himself, and he has a hard time holding the guitar for long periods of time now. Oh wow! Okay, which is re- really sad to hear. Uh, yeah. But when he did breeze and he did the line, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the people were standing up and dancing, but but nonetheless, back to the festival, very diverse group of because it's a two week long festival. Yeah, uh, and from what I read, it's the largest jazz festival in the world. Actually, yeah. they brag about that, and they yeah. take over the city street, the main street, yeah. and there's at least five stages and five theaters. Yeah, but super diverse, super diverse yeah. group of musicians. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I lived in Detroit, I don't know if you heard of the Detroit Jazz Fest. No. Well, do they no on. longer do the Detroit Jazz Fest? Is that yeah, they, I haven't it's, heard of? They, they, still okay. they still do. And I actually went there this uh, last Labor Day, my wife and I, because we missed it. It's free. Nice, nice. And guess what? They stick to traditional jazz. Oh, really? Four or five stages within the downtown Detroit area, off the water, oh, nice. overlooking Canada. Nice. Yes, and um, we went down there to hear some real authentic jazz. Do you remember any names no. that you saw? Oh my God! Uh, what's that new girl's name? Uh, Joy, uh, something Joy. What's her name? Uh, Singer. Yeah, Samara Joy. Ah, okay. Liz Wright. Um, oh, had, I know Liz Wright. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you had, um, God, I'm drawing a blank. There's so many artists. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> I know. It's a, when you do those festivals, man, you get overwhelmed sometimes. Yeah. Especially man, when they're have, free and you just wander from stage to stage. Yeah. You may have Herbie Hancock down there. I mean, all the major jazz guys have been, you know, they have a lineup that's just unreal. But it's all, you don't see any of this R&B stuff mixed in. They keep it pure. They keep it pure. Always have been. The tradition is to keep it jazz. So if you ever want to get away on a Labor Day weekend, oh, you want nice. to hear real jazz, it's a three-day festival, three or four-day festival. Excellent. And, um, mm-hmm. So, um, like I said, I used to go every year. Well, you know, I lived in Detroit, so I used to go down there and just check it out. And, you know, nice atmosphere off the water. You know, Very right cool. off the Detroit River, yeah. But all, uh, but all the, but but all the rest of the festivals across the country, uh, man, they mixing it in with all that R and B stuff. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. You know, you know, you know, like the shake your booty stuff. And I'm like, 
Okay. <laughs> I said, hey, you know. Well, no, to be fair, it is cool to hear. Yeah, you know, hip hop bleeding into some of these jazz uh, uh, albums that I that I hear come into my rotation. Yeah. You know, you hear yeah. you hear hip hop, you hear, and that's cool because, yeah, like we were talking about earlier, it's yeah. uh, it's 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 all one big family. It is. It is. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, it's all come together now. So everything is kind of like everybody's in the same pot no more. When you're talking about genres, it's almost like there used to be many genres. Now it ain't, you know, it's kind of narrowing hazy. down. Yeah, yeah, it's getting hazy. It's getting real hazy. Blurry. Man. blurry. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of like can't really identify. It's kind of like, uh, you know what I mean? So it is what it is, man. And uh, but, you know. I just stick to what I do and try to. I look forward to hearing your future stuff, man. Your, your acoustic with your daughter sounds yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, that uh, I, I got. Say, I got another single. I'm going to be releasing. Um, it's finished, and I'm going to. Uh, you know, uh, I just I'm going to be releasing a song that I wrote for my. I'm talking quiet because you won't be hearing, but I wrote a song for my wife. Oh, nice, nice. Um, it, it'll be on Spotify. Uh, how are you gonna? How's she gonna hear it for the first time? Well, I'm, on her birthday, which is a week from this coming Sunday, on the oh, 30th, very cool, man. I'm going to send her a text and a, and a link. <laughs> very cool. And uh, she's going to see her picture on an album cover when she was 19. I took an old picture when she was 19 because I've been knowing her since she was 19. Wow. And uh, so I'm going to, um, you know, and then I'm going to present it that song to her on her birthday. And her birthday is what day? June 30th. So I'll make sure this episode uh, comes out after June 30th. Because she'll okay. want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. and um, so uh, that's my next single that's coming out. And then and I'm going to, and I'm going to, on top of that, release another single on my own, which will probably be another, probably a couple of weeks after that. So I'm going to have two singles going at one time. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool paul and i have to say now that you mention it i think one of the the biggest underlying themes in your tracks are love yes uh, most definitely yeah I, you know you, you got to spread love man you know we got to keep that rolling because the world is <laughs> now more than ever right now more than ever man so yeah it's it, it's all about that man and um, do you think that comes from your gospel tradition most definitely Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was taught Jesus is love. You know, I was taught, you know, love conquers all. I was, you know, you know, if you stand on certain things, there's so many uh, things from a biblical t t uh, term that where love is the key. Mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. That's what, yeah, I mean, remember the Commodores made that song, Jesus is Love? Okay. You know, with Lionel Richie, it was a big song for them. You know, Lionel Richie, it was the Commodores. And uh, that was a major song for them. Uh, I'm quite sure you heard it. It was a popular song for, for them. And I don't know if it's an 80s. It probably got overshadowed by the Commodore's tunes I, I grew up with. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a big, that song there went big, though. And I was surprised. I'm like, ooh, boy, the Commodores are really stretching it. Yeah, they played that song on mainstream radio and everything. Any other performers that you saw touching on gospel that, that really caught your ear? That they became mainstream, like um, as far as instrumental just, or just vocal. Well, as, as far as non-gospel acts touching on their, their gospel, like of course Aretha Franklin's one of the big. Oh ones yeah, tons here. of them. Uh, yeah, you know Whitney Houston. You know that that them. kind of yeah. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, is a greater percent of most musicians come out of the church. Kirk Whalum. That's right. He comes out. Zerl uh, mm -hmm. Albright is a church guy. Okay, I'm talking instrumental guys. So you know, and so yeah, uh, yeah it's a whole lot of them. You know, mm -hmm. and so uh, as a matter of fact, Paul Jackson Jr. It really he has a gospel background, church gospel. Oh background. yeah, he's a church guy. I, I got to spin his catalog and see if I can yeah. pick those up. Yeah, he, he. I think I think he's recorded a couple, you know, but but for the most part, he was a studio guy, you know, 
mm-hmm. playing, um, you know, behind all these other greats. But right, right. So, but yeah, all these guys, they they they're church guys, you know. Uh, so most singers, mm, they yeah, come out of course. church, man. Yeah, yeah. singers especially, especially yeah. all the singers, man. So, so yeah, man. Well, uh, then, Paul, then that then that leads me to the one question that I ask every episode guest, and yep. I think you saw. I sent it ahead of time, so maybe you've done a little research. Maybe you'll know right off the top of your head what your answers are. Mm-hmm. But what three guitar songs? would you put on your desert island mixtape if you're on a desert island and you had a cassette tape with three tunes that you could live with hearing them over and over again what three guitar tunes would you pick to put on that mixtape okay number one would be breezing by george benson ah <laughs> phenomenal yeah why is that why what is it about breezing and and for me Breezing caught my ear because it's happy. It it oozes joy. That's it, it, it. It, you can tell that he's having it's that's what George Benson brought to the guitar was joy and fun and, and yeah. happiness. And that's exactly. that's what catches my ear. But well, the it, thing is, man, you said on a desert island, right? Yeah. So the thing is, you know, a desert island. And you don't have to be literal about it, but okay, why not? You know. Hey, the music that you're going to be listening to got to uh, kind of like vibrate high. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Vibrations, man. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, so it's got, you know, hey, the music got to be keeping you. You're not you know, picking the West level. Montgomery doing Stormy Monday or something. Like that. Right, gotta... right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So definitely breezing. My other one would be um, After Hours by Ronnie Jordan. Ronnie Jordan. You never heard that There's song? There's a name. Oh, I, I know Ronnie Jordan. Yeah. After, After Hours. Okay. okay. Yeah, pull that song up. It's a nice, chill song. After Hours. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And then my third one would definitely be, and then, you know, I got to put one of mine in there, would definitely be Dancing by the Sea. Excellent. Hey, good choice, man. Excellent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that would be it, man. That, so, that is a guy who has some pride in what he's recording, what he's done. A guy that's going to pick one of his own tunes. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I stand by my music. You know, I'm not a cocky guy, but then again, you know, I let other people uh, evaluate me. You know, because they're the ones that has to hear it. You know, and the thing is, Dancing by the Sea was it did well on radio for me. Um, Oh, cool. Yeah, you know, and uh, that was it was kind of like one of the go to's and I still do it today. Uh, live, you know, some of my shows and. Uh, when you yeah. when you sit down with the guitar in your lap and you're getting ready to just play at home, mm-hmm. do you do you noodle around? Do you go right to a tune? Do you when you when you construct a song, is mm-hmm. it constructed around a riff? Is it like, oh, I really dig what I just did there. Let me extrapolate on that and add to it and layer and, and have a lead in. And, and here's an A, B, A, B, C formula. I mean, how, how do you approach your tunes? Is that a loaded question because it's no, different it's not. every time? Okay. No, no, well, no. This is the way that I construct a tune, I would say, 80% of the time. I start from the bottom. I start from the foundation. It's like building a house, baking a cake. You get your main ingredients. So the main ingredients for me in a tune is the bass and the drums. Oh, okay. Okay. Before you even have a riff in mind. Yep. Because you know why? The riffs comes easy. Because of me being a lead singer and a saxophonist. Uh Uh-huh. I have those components all ready to go and I could pick and choose almost like that'll go with that. Or it'll just come to me something, you know what I mean? It just comes to me on the lead line or the melody line. So what happens is uh, I'll get the groove on the bass and I'll get the groove. You know, I get the husband and wife married because I believe <laughs> in the music, the husband is the bass or, or is, is the drummer and the bass player is the wife. Y'all got to gotcha. be, y'all got to be married and locked. 
So gotcha. once I got that groove happening, man, and then I get my melody line. Okay. Then once I get my melody line, the chord structure comes automatically. I can hear the chords automatically. So the melody you know I mean? line would be constructed on a guitar. Yep. Okay. Or I'll okay. hum it. I have so many songs that I haven't even recorded yet that I just sing in my phone. I could be I could be somewhere on a cruise. And I say, Oh, okay, here's a groove that um that just came to me. And then I'll I'll thump the bass line, then I'll hum the melody. Then when I get back home, I'll finish it up. You know cool. what I mean? Yeah, so, I have a little library like that on my phone too. Yeah, ex exactly. You know what I mean? And that's how that's how it's basically done. I mean, people are writing lyrics on toilet paper and you know yeah, I mean? right, right. You know I mean? Hey, wherever the song comes, I've I've had songs come to me in all sorts of different situations, places, times. Mm -hmm. I get I've gotten songs in dreams. Absolutely, full on concerts yeah. sometimes, oh, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. That song, I, I woke up and had the whole arrangements. But nine times out of ten, I um, uh, I'll hear the whole arrangement though. I get the whole, awesome. I get all, I get all the ingredients, at, you know, at one time, because that comes from my scoring. You know, when I uh. used to write, you know, write for the big band jazz, you know, I was hearing the trombones, what the trombones supposed to do versus the trumpets and saxophones. And, uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, you know, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's it's pretty interesting, you know, you know how it, you know, I I never. I'm not one to always pat myself on the back. I'm not that type of guy, man. But, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful for you know, the uh, abilities that I have, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you know, like in music, because I'm very quiet and I don't boast. You can so tell in your music, there's a, there's a subdued yeah. quality. It, you don't have these elongated solos. Your no. your guitar no. approach is, is uh, in respect to the tune. It's all about the yes. song. It's, it's not like, song. watch how flashy I can get. Yada, yada. Oh, no. it's, it's not that at all. No, man, because you know what? Hey, simplicity, I think, is the best. <laughs> sure. You know right? what I mean? Hey, you know what? Get in and get out. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, that comes from your gospel roots, too, because the gospel was about the song is delivering a message. There's it's nothing. Always, yeah, yeah. And the message is the most important part. Yeah. And, you know, even mm -hmm. if it's not gospel, you know, I mean, there's a lot of R&B songs that people understand that. Mm -hmm. They know it's not all about nothing but the song mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they know it's, it's only about the songs which is one of those you know it's only about mm -hmm. the song so the thing is you know true writers understand that you know true, true composers understand that mm -hmm. it's not all about you know you shining on an instrument or this and that but you know yeah you play a little riff but you know it's all about the song it's the guys who can really stand out while playing the song that really catch our ears. Right. Listen, you know? it don't take no listen, I tell a person, I said, listen, if you cannot express yourself within eight bars, you shouldn't be talking. That's a good rule. That's a good yeah, rule. I mean, I mean, all it takes is eight bars for you to play a solo. I mean, you know, especially on a recording now, if you not live, if you want to you can always stretch it out live. Live, you know. I always stretch it in 16 to 32 sure. bars. Okay. You know yeah. But if you record, you know, you don't need a 16 bar solo on a record. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Just get in, get out. You know what I mean? And just express, you know, and start from the bottom, climax. By the time you get to a seven bar, hey, you should be, you know, airborne. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Right. Good I point. mean, you know what I'm saying? So, um, so yeah, that's, that's the way it should, you know, I feel it should be approached all the time. Paul, I have to say, man, and, and I can't say it enough, thank you for your time. Your gigs are coming up in August. You're going to be doing, uh, your brother will be with you. Yes, uh, on both gigs, yeah. Like I said, I'll be at Shays Lounge on August 23rd. That's a Friday. And uh, we'll be going to um, Atlanta. It's Atlanta, St. James. St. St. James Live um, on Sunday the 25th. Paul, All thanks right, again, you. man. I appreciate it. You have a great weekend and okay. very best of luck on those concerts coming up. Sounds like Thank great fun. 
It is going to be fun, man. And I'll keep you posting on things, okay?